production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Malthrop. I'm a chief executive here. I'm also a proud member and I'm pleased to welcome our speaker today, the director of the Reinventing America's Schools Project at the Progressive Policy Institute and author of the book, Reinventing America's Schools, Creating a 21st Century Education System. His name is David Osborne. Last May, Governor John Kasich was part of a City Club forum on health care reform. I think some of you were in the room at the time. And from my point of view, the most interesting statement he made that day was not about health care at all, but about education. During the Q&A, City Club member Merle Johnson asked him a question, pivoting from health care to the health of our public schools, and asked the governor why Republicans were still pursuing school choice, even though a report out from the Fordham Institute found that two-thirds of charter schools were actually, in fact, failing. He didn't really answer that question, as Merle and I both remember. But what he pointed to was that debates of that sort amount, in his eyes, to tinkering around the edges of education reform, while the economy is fundamentally changing before our very eyes. The jobs that provide a middle class income today, he said, aren't going to exist when the effects of artificial intelligence truly begin to be felt. And he ended with this, quote, now I'm going to be out of office in a year and a half, and this is my Paul Revere warning. We've got to stop squabbling about this stuff and start thinking about new ways to get kids out there, get the skills, get them inspired. And the old way isn't working anymore, by and large, so we have bigger issues to fry than whether we've got school choice or we don't have it, or charters or vouchers or whatever. So here we are today with David Osborne. In his recent work, Osborne argues that charter schools provide autonomy, accountability, diversity of school design, and, a great, and greater parental choice than what could previously have been imagined. In addition to reinventing America's schools, creating a 21st century education system, Mr. Osborne is also co-author or co-author of six books on public sector reform, including the New York Times bestseller, Reinventing Government. He has also authored numerous articles for the Washington Post, The Atlantic, The New York Times Magazine, Harper's, U.S. News, Education Week, The New Republic Governing, and many other publications. Prior to joining the Progressive Policy Institute, Mr. Osborne has advised governments large and small, from cities, counties, and school districts to states, federal agencies, and foreign governments. In 1993, he served as a senior advisor to Vice President Gore to help run what the Vice President often called his Reinventing Government Task Force, the National Performance Review. Mr. Osborne was the chief author of the NPR report, which laid out the Clinton administration's reinvention agenda and was called by time, quote, the most readable federal document in memory. The bar for that, admittedly, was low. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming David Osborne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. And thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I am truly honored to be speaking at such a historic venue. Um, this is an amazing place, so thank you. Um, I also want to start by applauding Cleveland for what you've done with education reform, for your Cleveland plan and all of the improvements that have flowed from it in preschool, in high schools, and to a lesser degree in K-8 schools. Um, you've done some great work and you're on absolutely the right road. But have you ever wondered what the fastest improving cities in the country could teach you about education reform? Um, I'm gonna tell you about three of them today and then draw out some lessons from what they've done and then give a few ideas about how those lessons might apply in Cleveland. So the fastest improving city in the country over the last decade or more has been New Orleans because, as you know, Hurricane Katrina in 2005 flooded most of their schools. And what you don't know is that <clears throat> at that time, they were arguably the worst school district in the country, certainly one of the worst in the country. Uh, the quality was abysmal. 
In 2004, a study was done showing that 40% of adults in New Orleans could not read beyond an elementary school level because of the schools. It was also corrupt. 25 people, including the chairwoman of the school board, were indicted for corruption before and after Katrina. Um, so it was a big problem. And in 2003, in, in about 2000, the state had put in a test that you had to pass to graduate from high school. It was at a seventh grade level. In 2003, the valedictorian, let me repeat that word, the valedictorian at a high school in New Orleans failed that test five or six times, could never pass it. And there was no ruckus, there was no but, nobody protested, nobody raised their voices. And a woman on the State Board of Education, Leslie Jacobs, a businesswoman, who had been on the local board, then got herself appointed to the state board, had driven reforms on the state board in the accountability system, came to the conclusion, she had an epiphany, she said, you know what, people here have given up. They've just given up. They don't think these kids can learn. And we've got to do something to prove that these kids can learn. Now, being a business person, she and her brother had built their father's little insurance agency up into a big company and sold it off, and she'd created another insurance company. So she thought in business terms, and she thought, what we need is the equivalent of bankruptcy. We need something that, where we can take a school and let it start over wipe out all the rules, wipe out the union contract, wipe out the past, and start over. And so she invented this idea, which became called the Recovery School District, which is a statewide school district that takes over the worst, the very worst schools in the state, and then hands them to strong charter operators to try to restart with a clean slate. Then after Katrina, the district in New Orleans was on the edge of bankruptcy, and since Katrina eliminated their tax revenues, they were basically bankrupt. She went to the state superintendent and said, we cannot let Orleans Parish School Board reopen these schools. It would be criminal. We've got to do something. What she proposed was that the state put them all in the recovery school district. So they wrote a bill which said any public school in New Orleans, which performs below the state average on test scores and attendance, will go into the recovery school district. And both parties in the legislature and the governor, who was a Democrat, elected with support from the teachers unions and from New Orleans, were so fed up with the Orleans Parish School Board and the corruption <coughs> and incompetence that they passed it. And like that, over 100 schools went into the Recovery School District. They were flooded. There was a lot of rebuilding to do, um, a lot of renovation, a lot of new schools to build. That Recovery School District turned out to be what I'd call a high-quality authorizer of charter schools. Now, I know in Ohio, you, are, you, you folks are one of the poster children, along with Michigan, for doing charters wrong. <laughs> you created all of these sponsors get let all kinds of organizations sponsor charters and made them accountable to no one for the quality of those schools. And you got what logic would tell you you would get. Too many lousy schools that the sponsors don't close. So I understand that problem. I'm not saying you should have more of that model, okay? But in New Orleans, the Recovery School District was a strong author authorizer. It was very careful who got a charter, and in fact, it, it, there, were, there weren't like, you know, charter organizations lined up at the door, so they had to go slow. They converted about five schools a year over 10 years to charter operation, and most of them worked, some of them didn't. The ones that, they, that didn't, they closed or replaced with another operator. Uh, so they did their job. Um, next July, all those schools will return to the locally elected school board, Orleans Parish School Board, which will convert its last four traditional schools to charters. And New Orleans will be the first big city in the country with 100% of the kids in charter, public charter schools. 
and an elected school board. Now, I tell you that story because it's kind of interesting, but more important, the results. This is the fastest improving city in the country, if not in American history. Test scores, they switched like you did in 2015, they switched to a common Coraline test. But if you go, take the, from Katrina through 2014, the RSD schools in New Orleans improved for, almost four times as fast as the state average improved. In, before Katrina, 60% of the kids in New Orleans public schools were going to schools rated in the bottom 10% in the state. Today, it's down to 10%. Before Katrina, half the kids dropped out. In 2016, 76% graduated. Before Katrina, less than one in five went on to college. In 2016, 64% of the graduates went on to college, which was six points higher than the state average. So this is, and this was not because of demographic change. This has been studied left, right, and center. The kids are just as poor as they were before Katrina. Uh, this is because of organizational change. It is the only high poverty city in the country which outperforms its state on the most important metrics, high school graduation and college going. It's quite an achievement. But a lot of people write New Orleans off because it took a hurricane. And, you know, who else is going to have that? It's supposed to be a water here somewhere. And I understand that. We, but I think we can learn from New Orleans. And we can learn from other cities. So let's talk about the second fastest improving city, Washington, D.C. It's a totally different story. In 1996, Congress created a public charter school board in Washington, D.C. And over 20 years, it gradually began authorizing charters. Um, they did a pretty good job. The district, like New Orleans, was one of the worst in the country. It was corrupt. Quality was abysmal. Really high dropout rates. But by 2007, the charters had taken away about 30% of the kids, which meant close to 30% of the money. And on the third try, a mayor finally convinced the city council to give him control of the schools, just like you did in the 90s. Um, that mayor then appointed Michelle Rhee as chancellor. And you remember the headlines. Michelle Rhee broke a lot of eggs. But she pushed through some profound reforms. And her successor continued them. And the district has improved a lot. It's, it's very rapidly improving. There's one national test. You probably know this. The National Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP test. Uh, a, a random sample of kids in every state takes it every two years, fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade. And a random sample of kids in 21 big cities take it. DC's one of them. Over the last decade, DC has improved faster, both sectors, faster than any state. And the district alone has improved faster than any of the 20 other cities. That's why I say I think it's the second fastest improving city in the country. But the charters still outperform the district. The district, I, I, you know, my hat is off to them. They've done great stuff, and they do a great job of educating middle-class kids. But in the poorest wards in D.C., with the poorest kids, they haven't figured it out. Very low proficiency rates, whereas some of the charters have. And if you look at the comparative data in those wards 7 and 8, it's just night and day. So the final city I want to talk about is one that's a lot like Cleveland and that you've learned stuff from and they've learned stuff from you, Indianapolis. Um, in 2001, when their charter bill passed, it included a provision to let the mayor of Indianapolis authorize charters. And he, he was a Democrat. He started. They are now on their fourth mayor since then, both parties, two and two. And to everyone's surprise, they've done a great job. This is a very strong authorizer. They, they're careful who gets a charter, and they close the ones that, that don't work. 
Um, so they have a strong sector. Now, that charter law also allowed universities to authorize charters, just like here. And some of them did a lousy job, just like here. But the mayor and his staff basically leaned on them and helped them and gradually, there were only about three of them, but gradually convinced them to start closing the failures and clean up their act. So Indianapolis has a strong charter sector and it outperformed the district schools pretty significantly. So in 2012 and 2014, reformers got a reform board elected and they hired a new superintendent who believes deeply in school autonomy. And then together, the reformers and the superintendent went to the state legislature and asked them to pass a bill allowing the district to create what they call innovation network schools. Now, these are district schools in district buildings. They're part of the district accountability system, but they're organized as nonprofits, 501c3 organizations with their own boards. And they have a five to seven year performance contract with the district. So they have full autonomy, just like a charter, and they have real accountability, at least if the district does its job and enforces that contract, just like a charter. But they're not called charters. And they're moving fast. They've, this is, they're in their third year, they've got 16 of them. 20% of the kids in the district attend them now. Um, they, there are several ways you can become one. You can be a startup. You could be a charter that wanted a better financial deal and a building, and so became an innovation school. Or you can be a district school where the faculty votes to convert. And four schools have done that. It's amazing. They voted to leave the union, leave district employment. They keep, get, they keep their pension and benefits and become a nonprofit. And the reason they've done that, these are strong schools, and they know that they can do better for their, their kids if they have more autonomy. So rapidly growing, they're gonna open five more of them next year, open or convert five more schools next year. And uh, the good news is that these are the fastest improving schools within Indianapolis public schools jurisdiction. Fast, they're improving. They, many of them were, well some of them were failing schools that were replaced by startups. So low proficiency, but those rates are going up faster than any other kind of school in that jurisdiction. Faster than the charters, faster than the district schools. So it's working. And politically, it's been a lot easier than, than the charter path. Um, and Indianapolis is not alone. Chicago did this a decade ago. They call them contract schools. Philadelphia and Camden, New Jersey do it. They call them renaissance schools. Uh, Atlanta and Tulsa, Oklahoma just got into it. They call them partnership schools. There are 10 cities around the country using this kind of model. Um, and with this and chartering, I think what we're seeing, in my view, what we're seeing is the emergence of a new model of, of school district to fit the realities of today's world. Because um, the problem you know, with our urban school systems, it's not the people. Of course, there are a few people you wish weren't teaching. It's always the case, and even in private schools. But most of them, the vast majority of teachers and aides and nurses and social workers, they're, they're dedicated, they care about the kids, they're doing their best. But they are trapped in obsolete systems that were designed 100 years ago for a different world. They were trapped in systems designed to be, to use the cutting edge corporate idea of the day, which was called bureaucracy. <laughs> 100 years ago, that was a good word. It's hard to believe. They're centralized, and I'm not talking about today, but the, the model we inherited. You know, if you go back 30, 40, 50 years, they're very centralized, very hierarchical. All the key decisions were made at district headquarters. The principals, had very little control over who they could hire, who they could fire, what they could pay. Um, everyone was an employee of one organization. And by necessity, 100 years ago, the kids attended the school they lived closest to because they were walking. So they were assigned to a school. 
and their, their education was standardized. You know, when I came up, we were all taught the same thing the same way in the same order, um, and that was considered the fair thing to do at the time. They were controlled through rules, and as time went on, more and more, you know, every time something went wrong and there was a new rule put into place, um, and they were, no one was measuring performance for schools or teachers, and if they did a lousy job, the only people who experienced consequences were the students, the kids. So that's kind of what we inherited. And in the 60s and 70s, most of them unionized, which created another whole layer of rules. Um, so when the world changed, you know, in the 70s, the industrial era began to fade. You, you went through it here big time in Cleveland. And the information age was born. And everything changed. All these new technologies, the pace of change sped up. We went from a mostly national market to a global market. We went from a growing middle class to growing inequality. Um, when I was coming up, 20% of the students in public education in this country were children of color. Now it's the majority. Everything changed. And yet these systems were built to be stable. And they were so rule-driven, they're, they're quite rigid. And so they struggled. They struggled to cope with these changes. They were too centralized and hierarchical. So their principals and their teachers feel disempowered. And if someone feels disempowered, you never get 100% of their best effort, never. Um, they were one size fits all, treating all the kids the same. And you know, the truth is, kids come from different backgrounds. They, speak different languages, they learn differently, they're interested in different things, but no, we had a cookie cutter model. And finally, they were monopolies. School districts, the only way you could compete with a school district was by paying private school tuition. So they had a kind of monopoly. Um, they didn't have to change. So I think it was inevitable that they would struggle. But part of the genius of the American political system is that it, compared to other countries, we're pretty decentralized. And education is controlled at the, the rules are written at the state level and implemented at the local level. And so by the seat of our pants, driven by necessity, lots and lots of people have been innovating and reinventing and rethinking. And a new model has begun to emerge. Most people call it a portfolio model, which means that a district has, as yours does here, a portfolio of different kinds of schools to meet the needs of different kinds of, of students. And often it includes charters and traditional schools. Um, I love that description, and I love the guy who came up with it, Paul Hill, until our critics started calling us all corporate reformers, which is nonsense, but that's what they call us. And a portfolio model sure sounds like something a corporate reformer would have, right? So I decided to seize the verbal high ground. I call them 21st century school systems, because that's what they are. And what I mean by that is, rather than everybody working for one organization for, as an employee of a district, you have a bunch of autonomous, accountable public schools run by independent organizations. They have the operating authority. It's decentralized, but they have performance agreements or contracts or charters with the school district or an authorizer. And control is no longer just through rules. There are still some rules, but far fewer. Control is exercised mostly through accountability for results, the fact that you're gonna be closed if your kids are not learning. Also, different kinds of schools for different kinds of kids, different models, everything from Montessori to STEM to, to project-based learning, you name it. Um, and parents have choices, and the money follows the choice so that the parent has some leverage in dealing with the, the school. They can move their student, and the money moves with, it, with the student. And finally, there's no monopoly anymore because the schools are actually competing for students and money. That's what I would describe as a 21st century school district. And it works better for some obvious common sense reasons. One is the people who run the school actually get to run the school. I don't have time, but if you knew how little control a traditional urban principal has, 
It's astonishing. We ask them to do this really difficult job, and in most places, we tie their hands behind their back. So school autonomy. Second is accountability. If everybody in the building knows the school will go on and on and on, and they have jobs for life, you get one culture. If everybody in the school knows that they have five years to prove that they can really help students learn, and if they don't, their school is closing, and everybody loses their jobs, you get a very different culture and sense of urgency. Third choice, if you want different models for different kids, you can't impose them. I can't order you to send your kid to a Montessori school and you to send your kid to a STEM school. That makes no sense, so you have to give the parents choice. And it works because the schools are now accountable to the parents because the money moves with them. And finally, the tough thing politically is that it works best if the schools are not part of the district with district employees, if they're actually independent organizations. And there's two reasons for that. One is when school districts have to both steer, that is set policy and direction and make sure that they've got the right mix of schools and they're meeting everybody's needs, and row, that is operate a bunch of schools, it's very hard to do both well. Rowing always trumps steering because there's always a crisis of the day that demands attention. Second reason is political. If you're a school board member, particularly if you're elected, and you, you have thousands of employees, what if you have some failing schools and you want to close them and replace them? Well, you know that's going to upset the adults in those schools, and their union is going to launch a system-wide protest and probably next time you run for a re-election, you're going to lose because the turnout is about 10 or 15 percent, and a lot of them are teachers and staff and their spouses. So in essence, you're politically captive of your employees. But if you're contracting with schools, when you close a couple, all the other operators look at that and say, ah, oh, there's some open buildings. We're ready to replicate. Maybe we could get, maybe we could help the kids in that building. Big difference in the politics. So the evidence from New Orleans and Washington, D.C. says that in a decade or less, you could double the effectiveness of your public schools with this approach. Um, what does that mean for Cleveland? Well, just a few ideas really briefly. Um, you're already on the right path. You've done great stuff with high schools. Uh, I think it's time to start replacing failing K through eight schools faster. Uh, turnaround efforts, which is what you've invested in mostly, are really hard, and nationally, they usually fail. Closing and completely replacing with a new team is far more effective. Secondly, give the schools full autonomy and accountability. Um, you've, you've moved far in that direction. The principals here get over 50 control of over 50% of the money, which is important. They have hiring authority and you've made it possible to, to get rid of poor teachers. So you're well on the way. More autonomy, they'll work better. And you'll keep the most entrepreneurial principles. Third, the best way to get those, that autonomy is to have them be independent organizations, nonprofits, like in Indianapolis. I think that model is really exciting. Um, and it will get you real autonomy and hopefully real accountability. Fourth, you have a common enrollment system for district schools, and I know that the district wants to get charters into that. That's really important because if you don't have, if, if a parent has to sign up for eight different schools to get their kid into a quality school, then only the parents who have the time and energy and knowledge to do that will do that, and other parents will be at a disadvantage. There will not be equity, so if you want a more equal playing field, you've got to get everybody in the common enrollment system. And finally, and this is the hard one, it's time to get rid of some of those charter sponsors. You've got way too many. And I know that's a state law issue um, and will be controversial, but um, it was a huge mistake to have so many in Ohio. So that's a very aggressive agenda. I know that. The politics are tough. But, you know, the lives of tens of thousands of children are at stake. We can make a real difference. We can transform so many lives. And with it, we can transform cities. 
because when you have a quality public school system, it changes your city in all kinds of good ways. So you're on that road, you're partway down that path, and I wish you the best of luck in the rest of your journey. Thank you. Today at the City Club, we're enjoying a Friday forum with David Osborne, director of the Reinventing America's Schools Project at the Progressive Policy Institute. He's also the author of Reinventing America's Schools, Creating a 21st Century Education System. We're about to begin the audience Q&A, and we welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our radio broadcast, our webcast, or the Facebook Live video. If you'd like to tweet a question, you can tweet it at the City Club, and our team will work it into the program. You can also leave your question in the comments section of our Facebook live stream. Our staff will also be looking there for questions. Holding our microphones today, our content coordinator, Bliss Davis, and our membership and youth forum council chair, Tiolu Orsanya. May we have our first question, please? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Merle Johnson. I'm a member of the State Board of Education and I want to welcome you here today. Um, Thank you. I am uh, very concerned about the uh, anti-union talk that you had. Um, I'm concerned that when there are not unions in buildings, a lot of times teachers don't get treated with the respect they deserve, and um, they need a voice in what's happening there. But that's not my question. <laughs> um, my question is, I have a friend who works very, very closely with uh, the schools in New Orleans. Uh, she's been doing that for years. And what she said was that before her, Hurricane Katrina, the schools and the teachers and the students and the parents were begging for resources to be able to improve the schools, such as computers and so forth. But suddenly, after Hurricane Katrina, when charter schools moved in, those resources were suddenly available. So my question to you is, would that have something to do what, with why charter schools are doing better? I don't think so. Um, the reality in New Orleans is that a lot of those charter schools started in portable buildings um, that were not very attractive because the, you know, the old schools had been destroyed and they had to very rapidly pave parking lots and put porta portable buildings on them. And you, you wouldn't believe some of the places that, that the kids were going to school. Um, so yes, a lot of resources poured in. FEMA spent $2 billion, gave the school district almost $2 billion. But you know, they'd lost a, over 100 schools. They had to rebuild. They're still building new schools with that money. And philanthropic money came in. but. The schools had to, you know, they'd lost all their supplies, all their computers, desks. I mean, they, there was a huge challenge. And if you look at the money, you know, New Orleans spends per pupil eleven to twelve thousand dollars a year. It's kind of mid-range for Louisiana. Um, in D.C., charters get five to six thousand dollars less per student every year than district schools, and nationally. Charters get 72 cents for every dollar that district schools get on average. It varies from state to state. So I think the money argument would, would sort of say that charters are even more effective than the data presents. And as for unions, charters can be unionized. You know, unions can organize charters, and they do. Um, if, the, if the teachers are being treated badly, they should. But in a lot of these schools, in, in well-run systems, where they close the lousy schools, um, you find teachers treated as professionals. And they have a role in helping to run the school. And you find a career ladder where teachers, good teachers become teacher leaders and mentor and coach other teachers. Then they become deans. Then they become school leaders. Then they found new schools. Um, so I think there's a reason that many of them don't choose to unionize, because they don't feel the need. Another one? Uh, Mr. Osborne, your, uh, your, your examples have primarily concerned large school systems, large <laughs> urban school systems. Right. And uh, of the three examples you started with, two of them you described as having been corrupt enterprises. Um, Ohio has over 600 school systems. Mm -hmm. 
So when you talk about creating a 21st century education system, is this something you believe is extensible throughout the entire uh, 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 spectrum of school systems, from the one that graduates thousands every year to the one that graduates a few dozen every year? Yeah. Please. Great question. Great question. Um, I think that this model uh, will and should work in most school districts, but probably not rural areas. Um, right now, it's only going to happen mostly in cities and close-in suburbs that have high poverty. Some of that's going on. Uh, but as it proves itself there, I think it will spread. Um, and we're talking about a long term. You know, when we, when we created these bureaucratic school systems, it was over a 50, 60 year period. And I think that's what we're talking about as a transition time here. Now, the reason I say maybe not for rural areas is geography works against you. It's so much harder to have schools to choose from in a rural area because you've usually just got one of each kind, one elementary, one middle, one high school. And I used to live in a town for 25 years of 3,000 people. And I know that in a town like that, everything's personal relationships. And it's just hard for me to imagine a elected school board there saying to a school, well, your five years is up and you've done a lousy job, so you're all gone and we're gonna contract with somebody else to run this school. It just can't quite see that. So that's my, that's my view. And I don't have a crystal ball, so I could be wrong. One of the models that, we, that some charter schools develop is where they have the children be made at home and they do the education through computer systems and, and they're working there. Um, first of all, what's the outcome with those kind of systems? Are they effective? And how do they fit in with the model that you've been discussing? Well, there have, as you know, I'm sure, there have been a lot of large virtual charters, as they're called, that have done a terrible job and have terrible outcomes. And sadly, some of their sponsors have not done their job. I mean, the, the solution is for the sponsor to warn them, tell them to fix it, measure more closely, inspect more closely, and then close them if things don't improve. That's the model. That's what works. And if you're not doing that, it's not going to work that well. I think there's a place for virtual schools. There are some kids who do better not being at school, whether it's because they're being bullied or some other reason. Um, I respect that. Uh, but I think we have to be really careful. And we haven't been in, in Ohio and Pennsylvania and some other states. We have not been careful. We have been careless. And we've gotten the charter movement has gotten a lot of black eyes from it. Do the schools in New Orleans, uh, do they give their charter school developers of buildings? That's something they don't do in Ohio. I opened a charter school in- They do. In I, New I opened a charter school in 2000. We had to struggle for our buildings. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of uh, developers failed because they couldn't afford the building. They had to widen the halls, put new commodes in there. They couldn't afford to do it. They used the first years, they used the first check to uh, uh, refurbish the building, then they couldn't make it up. They end up going to jail. Now, the second question is... Wait, wait, I can never remember more than one, so I'm going okay, to well, answer, answer the that's first good. one. That's good enough. Then I'll come back. Um, <clears throat> yes, in New Orleans, they got buildings um, because they were converting a whole system. And they had the... Well, they didn't have the building. They had to rebuild them, but they had money to, to rebuild them. Uh, most state charter laws don't give funding to charters for buildings, though, and it's a huge flaw, and it's the biggest problem for charters in most states. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate your valuing the contributions that charters can make and say that I think to your point that when you have highly motivated principals who have accountability that unions are not needed, but that's not my Question. My question has to do with the potential of segregating learners based on their individual needs. So there's a, a debate now going about 
whether or not you should have children who have behavioral challenges and children who have learning challenges and children who are sort of regular education students and students who are college bound, whether these students should be segregated or whether they should be included into one school building, one school classroom, and which of the two models is more successful. You know, on this and so many other questions, people think there's one right answer. And I disagree. I think there are lots of different kids who will thrive in different environments and their parents should be allowed to make the choice of the environment that they think their chi child is going to thrive in. I have four children, so they went to mostly public schools, but a couple of private schools along the way. At one point we had four kids in four different schools, partly because of age and partly because of issues with schools. It was a nightmare. but. We were making choices. And I just don't think that, I think some parents and children will thrive in an environment where all kinds of kids are brought together and educated together. And others, like a kid with autism, for example, might thrive better in a school like yours, which, which are really built for kids with disabilities. And so I think we gotta get rid of this idea that there's one best way and realize, no, kids are different we need different models, and let's let the parents choose. Let's give them as much information as we can, and we don't do a good enough job of that in most places. Let's really reach out to them and help them make good choices, but let's let them make their choices. You've spoken of parental choice, and you mentioned dollars following the pupils in mm -hmm. terms of uh, supporting the schools. Uh, this sounds a little bit like Milton Friedman's sort of universal voucher approach. I know in the book you argued a bit against that, and I, I wonder if you could tell us about what did your research find, or what, what evidence is there to show there's a limitation to what we can expect from vouchers and, and vouchers. Voucher. Okay, thank you. So I have no problems with vouchers for inner city students uh, to go to private schools, uh, because that expands opportunity for them. As long as those schools are accountable in some way for quality education, which often in voucher programs they're not. Uh, but there are some states like Louisiana and Indiana which have voucher laws that's, that apply the accountability laws to the voucher students as well and to the voucher schools as well. The research says that you can do vouchers well and you can do them poorly and usually we don't pro provide enough money or enough accountability and so we, don't, we get very disappointing results. Um, but it varies from place to place. Um, my big worry, though, is when people want vouchers for all students, or most students. And that's what the leadership of our Republican Party today would really like in many cases, universal voucher systems. And Arizona has passed a law that's going to lead to that eventually. So imagine what will happen. So the voucher, let's say, for a middle schooler is worth $10,000 and you can take it to the middle school of your choice. Well, everybody in this room here loves their children. And from the looks of you, some of you could afford to add money to that $10,000. And I do not believe that any legislature in this country will ever say to parents, sorry, if you take a voucher, you can't spend another dime on your kid's education. I just don't think that'll fly politically in America. So what that means is that we would all add money and we would have buy, be buying $40,000 educations and $30,000 educations and $20,000 educations and then many, many families would be stuck in $10,000 schools. And the education market would gradually become like every other market, housing, cars. You know, we would have Mercedes schools and Cadillac schools and Buick schools and Chevy schools and then used car schools for, for lots of families. And I think that would be both really bad for our future and really unfair. Um, so I, I, I really worry. I think if we go down that path, uh, it means widening inequality and it means increasing intolerance because kids won't go to school with kids from different social classes and different skin colors and different accents and all those things that teach you that you know, beneath their skins, everybody's really the same.
<laughs> Thank you for coming uh, to Cleveland. Thank Can't you. wait to read your book. It sounds great. Um, I have a question, though. Um, it seems like power and greed are always uh, a core problem to like our students not getting the best education. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how, uh, like a city like DC, somehow or another, people are actually uh, willing to give up their fiefdoms in order to improve the services that the students should have been getting? Well, I wish they were more willing, <laughs> you know. It was a political battle all the way. So Congress, well, first of all, the city council passed a charter bill in 95, but it was quite weak, and the charter advocates were very disappointed in it. So then Congress passed one in 96, which was quite strong, well written. They'd researched all the charter laws around the country. They did a really good job of it. So there was a lot of pushback for years against the charters, efforts to keep them to this day, the district doesn't want to give them buildings, empty buildings. Um, the teachers union, which was anti-charter, had a huge scandal about three years into, three or four years into chartering, where they were, it was an AFT local and the leaders were stealing money, millions of dollars. So the AFT, the national took it over and that kind of politically gave charters a breathing space for a while when they needed it, because the union was really disorganized. And then a mayor was trying to get control of the district and failed twice in the city council. And then finally in 2007, a mayor succeeded. But given the re all those reforms, I mean, Michelle Reed laid off a lot of people. She closed a lot of schools. And the backlash was that her mayor lost his reelection. He was a one-term mayor. And it was one of the big reasons. It wasn't the only reason he lost, but it was one of the big ones. So people didn't give up power and so on willingly very often. Now, interestingly, you've got to a situation where 47% of the kids are in charters. So it's sort of half and half. And people have just accepted it. And now the two sectors work together a lot. There's, there's a surprising amount of collaboration. People going back and forth in jobs from one sector to another. And everyone seems to have kind of relaxed about it. And the politicians can't afford anymore to discriminate against charters because there's too many charter parents who vote. So it's a better situation. But it was tough for a long time. Who's next? I'm next. Thank you for coming to Cleveland. Um, I'm from Newark, and so I understand oh, a lot about charters and district schools. And I have a question about are we debating the right thing? Even charters these days, even in Newark and New Orleans, have a hard time helping their students successfully navigate college and career. And yep. So I kind of would love your view on aligning those two different systems. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, and it's very true. You know, the, the average, well, for the lowest income quartile, meaning the bottom 25% income-wise of families, their kids, only 14% of them complete college within six years. Whereas nationally, it's like between 40 and 50% for the average. So it's a huge issue. And it's one that the charters, the best charters discovered about six or seven years ago when they began having enough graduates who'd had enough time to get through college and they started surveying them and realizing, oh my God, you know. One of them, for example, I remember, was disappointed that only 55% of their graduates had made it through college. Well, 55% is above the national average and these were low income kids, so they'd done great, but, but these folks are so motivated, they completely reinvented their schools to drive that number higher. So what you find now is that KIPP and lots of the other high quality charter networks, they hire people at the high school whose job it is to get the kids through college. And they provide money. So if a child like is $100 short, 
to buy books or to get home for vacation or buy food, that student has somebody to call. They've got a relationship with somebody at the high school who's, who's going to respond and help them. So we're kind of in chartering 3.0 now, and, and this is one of the big challenges that everybody's trying to figure out. How do we help these kids get through college? Um, there's a lot you can do before college with that to, to improve the chances, but then you have to do things while they're in college. And, and this is, to me, part of the beauty of, of, of the charter sector when it's done well. You know, have you, do you know any traditional high schools that hire people on staff to get their graduates through college? I've never seen that. But it's very common now in the charter world because these schools, they're kind of like the Peace Corps people from the 60s. You know, these people are so dedicated and they will do whatever it takes to help those kids succeed. Thank you for coming to Cleveland. We appreciate it. Oh, I have a you. question about your proposal that would involve taking a failing public school district and turning it over to a nonprofit. We have talked about that or, or another school in Cleveland, but the sticking point for me has always been what happens to the children in that school because right. the preference is those kids go away or we keep the kindergartners, first and second graders, which, you know, in an ideal world, that would be great. But there's sixth, seventh, and eighth graders in our buildings. So how do you approach that in that scenario? Yeah, there's a lot of places have struggled with this question. Uh, it's a great question. And there are several ways that they've dealt with it. So, and it's really situational. What do you think will work best for the kids in your community? Um, so, some places, if there are strong schools nearby that the kids could go to, they'll just close the failing school and then reopen it, but just reopen it for, say, K-1 and then add a, a grade per year, and the kids go to the nearby schools. But often with a failing school, you're in a really poor community, and the nearby schools are pretty bad, too. So that, I'm sure that's quite common here. Um, you can... And, and you've done this with high schools. With the restart, you can start with, say, K-1, and keep the old school educating two through eight, and gradually phase it out as you phase the new one in. That brings other problems. The people in the phase-out school are not usually too happy, and you start to lose teachers, and um, it sure isn't perfect, but it's one approach. So those are at least two. I think there's a, I'm trying to think, there's, there's a third approach which is not coming to mind at the moment. Um, I guess the third approach is that the, the new operator, if you're really convinced that they're really good and they know how to turn around a school, give them all the students. So there are some operators in New Orleans and some other places that have, have begun to do this and it's really hard because the problem with taking say grades K through eight all at once, is you inherit this culture. These kids have been convinced for years that they can run in the hallways, they can have fights, they can you know, tune out the teacher. Um, you just get this, all of these bad habits, and the first thing you have to do is change them, change that culture, and it's hard. So if you have an operator who can do it, who's proven they can do it, great. But otherwise, be careful, because often it's not gonna work. Thank you, David, for uh, all your school choice, um, advocating for school, school choice, especially when we celebrate the National School Choice Week. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from one of the charter schools in uh, Cleveland Horizon Science Academy, and we are often, as charter schools, as accused, especially in Ohio, that we steal the money from uh, um, traditional public school and students from traditional public school system. How would you respond to the accusation? Well, this is, you know, this is the common criticism all over the country that charters take the money away from the district schools. Well, I don't think the district schools own the money. I think it's the taxpayer's money. And I think their purpose in spending it is to educate children. So if you have a school called a charter school that's doing a great job of educating children, why 
is its money taken away. It's not taken away from the taxpayers. It's done, doing exactly what the taxpayers want. So I think it's, it's a question that comes from a place that only a monopoly would think that way. It's our money and they're our kids. That's monopoly thinking. And we gotta change it. Well done, sir. Thank you very much. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been enjoying a Friday Forum with David Osborne, director of the Reinventing America Schools Project at the Progressive Policy Institute, also author of Reinventing America Schools, Creating a 21st Century Education System. Our forum today is the Myron N. Crotinger Endowed Forum, made possible by a generous gift from Mr. Crotinger. We appreciate his support of City Club programs. Today's forum is part of our Education and Innovation Series, sponsored by the Nordson Corporation. Cecilia Render of Nordson is with us today. We thank you so much for your support. It's also part of our Authors in Conversation series, supported in part by the residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We are grateful to many of you here today for your support of City Club programming through that public grant. Our community partners for today's forum are the Cleveland Transformation Alliance and Metro Catholic Schools. Hotel accommodations are provided by the Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. We appreciate your support. We also welcome guests at tables hosted by Cuyahoga Community College. And that brings us to the end of our forum today. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.